So welcome, Andy. Um, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, this is going to be a fun topic because, especially because last week actually was we did female sexual health. And I think that, you know, females are, we're very comfortable talking about our hormones. It's something that we're just very used to. And this was a topic where I feel like it doesn't get much attention, especially when it comes to nutrition. So I'm really glad that you're able to come on and, and chat about it. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to get uh, to get into this subject. I mean, you know, like we discussed off camera, I just wrote an article on men's sexual health and nutrition. And look, I think it's an area that you don't see discussed that often, even though there are, you know, is, is it overwhelming evidence? Maybe not, but there's definitely some serious evidence pointing in certain directions around diet and, you know, um, sexual performance and hormones and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. And so certain people's ears might perk up when we talk about different subjects and we're going to keep a lot of, a lot of research in here and, and maybe just share some, some opinions based on general science, how that works. Um, but before we dive in, I just want to state that Andy is a registered dietitian and he is in private practice. And some of you may know him as being the, the, the king of kale is what I would, <laughs> I would say. I'll take um, that but also the king of food humor. So you've got some amazing, uh, I don't know what you would call them, like memes on your Instagram? Yeah, qu quotes, memes, yeah. yeah. Well, I do a little bit of both. I like to diversify the portfolio, so, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. So anything else that you would add, like how did you get into private practice and kind of what are you doing right now? Yeah, well, I mean, I got into private practice five years ago, six years ago. It's hard to keep track now because time is flying pretty quick. Mm -hmm. I just felt like it was something I wanted to do when I was between jobs and it just seemed like the right thing to do in the moment. And I kind of just jumped into it at that point. I mean, it was something I always wanted to do. It's not as if I, I did it out of, out of necessity. I just always wanted to do it. And I guess the main thing to know about me besides that, I mean, I've written a bunch of books and I love writing. So, uh, yeah. That's awesome. And one of the many things that I love about your, your blog posts in particular is um, you know, they're very short to the point evidence-based and, you know, there's nothing worse than going to a blog post where you just kind of want to get, you know, professional opinion, research, and then kind of the takeaway. And you do a really good job at, at doing that all. So I appreciate that. Yeah. I try some are better than others and, but I try. Yeah. So I, I appreciate the comment. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start off with, um, you know, what, what are male hormones? Like what hormones do males even have? Because I know that this can be, you know, people always think testosterone, but what are other hormones that males have? Yeah, well, I think quite honestly, I mean, testosterone ends up being the, the focal point. And obviously there are a bunch of precursors as well to testosterone. Uh, I think one of them is DHEA. I'm not even, I'm going to butcher something in there, but that's a precursor. I mean, the reality is funny enough, and yeah, there, there's, there's, there's different, types of testosterone testers bound testosterone and free testosterone and stuff like that. But when you look at like male hypogonadism and, and the things they used to like diagnose like low testosterone to justify testosterone therapy, quite honestly, they do look at, you know, your, your testosterone levels and there's a cutoff point. So, I mean, that really is the one that gets the most attention and then it's testosterone replacement therapy. And obviously testosterone is one of a group of, you know, of androgens, but it really is. I think from what I've seen and what I've read, it really is the one that is the focal point to be perfectly honest. Yeah, I wouldn't. I don't know if I, you've seen differently. No, I, I did a Google search to say what what male what hormones do males have, and right. all of the search lines were how to increase your testosterone, what you know, testosterone boosting foods, how to maximize testosterone, and I and I knew the answer. I knew that that males had some estrogen and progesterone, but I right. just wanted to see what came up, and it was almost impossible to find just a list of what hormones males had. And so right. I just looked up, you know, how much estrogen is normal in the male body. So, so yes, we know that testosterone is the main focus and it's what men are typically caring about and using as a marker of health, which I think is a good segue into what are the benefits of testosterone and, and what does it do in the body? And, and I think that's most important. Yeah, I mean, the context of an adult male, I mean, testosterone plays uh, very, very important roles in, in body composition, maintaining muscle mass, you know, ma maintaining uh, bone strength. And so you see, you know, decreased bone density and changes to body composition of people who, whose testosterone levels are too low. You know what I mean? Obviously, there's also a massive role to play in sexual functionality, libido, energy, sex drive, sexual performance. I think those are the big three. 
uh, and the list goes on from there. But those are probably the big three people are most concerned with sexual performance and then body composition, right? I mean, really, if you, the interest in testosterone probably comes down to those two things more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, the, the strength side of things and the manliness, but I think also, and this, this can also be said for females is when your hormones are out of balance, you just don't feel like yourself. Yes. Mood as well. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of things like, just like your vitality and, you know, motivation and things like that, that can really just, um, you know, make you feel like you're almost kind of living in a shell. I think that's the best way to describe it. Right. And yeah, that is one of the, the potential signs uh, of lower. I mean, the real, of the, I mean, I guess the, the unfortunate reality is on some levels that that could be a sign of a lot of things, right? Yes. Um, low energy, lack of focus, but that is definitely a sign of low testosterone levels. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now do you, do you particularly um, do any sort of testing in your practice with males or have, you know, feel like you see a lot of people reporting that they have altered levels of testosterone or? Yeah. So in my experience now, obviously you guys are, you're in the States, I'm in Canada, right? So the healthcare system is very different. So Mm -hmm. it's a little bit more complicated, I think here to just pop on over and get your testosterone tested. I think Mm -hmm. there has to be a very good reason with public health care for testosterone to get tested. And I've actually seen, uh, I saw a study out of the States, I think it was the American Neurological Association. They said that 25% of people on testosterone replacement therapy didn't even have their testosterone levels checked to begin with, right? Mm. So I think that's a reflection of, at least partially the, the um, privatization of medicine where you can do that kind of stuff, even though if it's not you know, justified, so to speak, which is quite different here in Canada, as far as I know. Mm. Where if you're, get, if you're getting that therapy, if it's being covered in any fashion, um, by public health care, whatever. And I actually don't know the full details on that because it doesn't actually come up that often um, mm. in my practice. I don't get males who actually very often have their, their stuff tested, but I think it's a little bit different. Uh, let's put it that way yeah. from that perspective. That's a good point. No. I mean, yeah, to, to think of the differences in healthcare, that's a really excellent point. I didn't even think about that and forgot to even mention that you were in Canada. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, when I work with clients, um, you know, we definitely look at that as being a marker because a lot of males, when they, they aren't feeling well, or especially with sex drive, they'll go to their doctors and say, you know, I want you to test my testosterone. Right. Um, now, so the symptoms, so if we kind of come back to what are some of the symptoms now, you mentioned, um, you know, bone health and sex drive and mood. And so some of the symptoms of, you know, maybe having low testosterone could be just basically seeing certain changes in that. Would you say that's correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, I mean, especially when these things are not easily explained by something else, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that that can be part of it. Now, sometimes if there's issues with, like, I mean, if anything happens to the testicles or the pituitary gland, I think if there's injury there, if there's medication that's affecting those areas, um, that can also affect testosterone levels, but then you would have a more, you know, a more reasonable understanding as to what's going on. But if you're having unexplained issues with sex drive or sexual functioning or like body composition changes, I mean, bone density is, is not as easy to, to realize, right? So you that's not necessarily going to be what, yeah, you know, that's not what's going like, to you know, tip you off. But um, yeah, I have, a, I have a feeling that a lot of it will have to do with uh, decreased sex drive, decreased sexual performance, and then decreased energy and mood and things like that. Those are you know, probably big drivers. Yeah, I see a lot of, of males, even in you know, their early 30s right now, who are using uh, testosterone replacement therapy. And I think there, we should definitely talk about you know, what are some of the potential side effects of that just so that people are aware, because I think, you know, we, we, I think in terms of hormones in general, whether it's female or male, we just assume that, you know, if we have a symptom, you just kind of replace the hormone and that kind of fixes everything. But especially as someone who, who really focuses on finding the root cause of, especially my own clients, you know, the root cause of what their health issues are, oftentimes if we're just supplementing with something that we assume is either low or missing or out of balance, um, it's not usually getting to the root cause. And, and that's not to say there aren't situations where someone might have a genetic predisposition or, you know, some sort of thyroid issues, things like that, that go into it, but it's definitely very common. Yeah. I mean, my understanding of the best practice is, you know, when you get like if you get put on a TRT, right, this testosterone replacement therapy, you know, it's for a specific reason. And if mm-hmm. it doesn't remedy that reason, then you stop taking it, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that is, I, I believe that is the best practice. I mean, it sounds logical to say, 
but I don't know if that's always what it gets followed. Now, I mean, you know, you, you know testosterone, too much testosterone, you know, too, you know these, these, these steroid hormones. I mean, obviously, you know, acne comes up as one. I think there's conflicting evidence as to, as to how it affects the prostate. Um, mm. I think some, you, you see a little bit that it could increase the risk of prostate cancer. I don't know if that's actually the case. Uh, you see like little, little bits of that. Um, certainly, there could be issues with fertility, I think, if levels are, are, are you know, chronically too high. I've seen that as well. So it's not all just fun and games. Let's put it that way. And now if 25% of people, which is the number I saw, are, are not even getting their testosterone measured in the first place before they get it. I mean, I don't know if they're, if, I don't know what the level of monitoring is after that, but if it's too chronically too high, I mean, there's going to be consequences for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So as you mentioned, you know, risk of potential risk of cancers, um, you know, aggression, I think different, definitely changes yep. in mood um, and, and acne. So seeing those effects, any other symptoms that you would add to that of, of maybe seeing an increase of testosterone? Yeah. I mean, I, not that comes to mind. I mean, I, I know that there are questions, like I said, over, over fertility. And I think there's even a recommendation that if someone's trying to conceive that they don't take TRT, I believe I saw that recommendation of by the American uh, Neurological Association. I think it was because I did, I was looking at their guidelines the other day. Um, so I think there's a recommendation like that, but in terms of like overt symptoms, uh, the other one, if there are other ones that are eluding me right now. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's what I saw in the research that I did prior to this, but again, just a pretty brief overview. So just interesting. Now nutrition, this is our expertise. I mean, right. really we can talk about hormones all day and kind yeah, of, we, we made it, we made it to this part. Yeah. Now we're going to be more comfortable now. Good. <laughs> we can through it and get to, get to where we really can dive in here. Right. So how is our nutrition related to our male hormones? Because it's not, it's not the question of if, because we know nutrition plays a huge role in both male and female hormones. Um, but the point that I just made is you see uh, so many people supplementing with testosterone or on replacement therapy. And um, you know, oftentimes I think we're not addressing, you know, what does your diet look like? And mm -hmm. what a what a missing link and a missing opportunity for something that plays such a huge role. Right. Well, I mean, look, I think when it comes to, you know, male male sexual health, right, there's two things that are of interest, right? There's yes, there's there's testosterone levels, right? Hormone levels, and then there's just just the case of erectile dysfunction in, in its most like the most practical pragmatic thing because that affects you on a daily basis. Now there's a link between the two. Low testosterone can increase your risk here, but both of these conditions, which I think are of the most interest, they're, they are pretty strongly linked from what I've seen to like to um, glucose and you know and fat metabolism. You know what I mean? So you know how is the you know how's the blood sugar control? You know as you know with like type two um, diabetes, the prevalence of erectile dysfunction goes up. Mm. You know what I mean? Especially if blood sugars are pure, purely controlled and you know, in the article that I wrote recently, I saw that refined carbohydrates were correlated with uh, lower testosterone levels. So increase in refined carbohydrate intake, decrease in testosterone levels, right? So that's kind of case in point as it relates to insulin metabolism. And then when you look at, you know, erectile dysfunction, there is like a ton of evidence that, you know, high cholesterol, for example, which is like one of the most common reasons why someone will take medication in North America, Mm. is uh you know is one of the leading dietary dietary modifiable risk factors because not all of them are modifiable by diet but it's one of the most leading modifiable risk factors for erectile dysfunction right mm. so there's a strong connection there between uh you know the fat fat and uh and sugar metabolism and uh testosterone levels and i even saw some stuff on magnesium too which we can talk about later yeah and and yeah. to get to the point of you know blood pressure and, and just heart medications in general we know that those can affect erectile dysfunction and just general blood flow to that area, we need to have, you know, proper muscle function. And there's certain medications that, um, you know, deplete our zinc levels, which we'll get into of how important zinc is for maintaining testosterone. But when we, you know, not only just having the physiological um, detriments that come with these, these conditions, but also then, you know, typical course of action is let's give them a medication for it which mm -hmm. typically can make it worse. And that's something you, you know, can speak to your doctor about, but um, you know, it just, it's kind of the sequence of events where we're not doing ourselves any favors. Right. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You know, and, and, and even on the, the note of uh, magnesium. So there are some nutrients. We'll just talk about, I'll talk about this briefly before we get to the next point. You know, from what I've seen, it's, you know, there's, there's definitely a connection with iron intake. There's definitely a connection with, with zinc intake, like you said, but the population data that I've seen in Canada, zinc and iron don't tend to be issues in terms of the average person getting enough. Now medication mm -hmm. can change that fair enough, but magnesium is more interesting because magnesium, you know, is found in foods that someone could, could easily miss if their dietary pattern is not quite 
how it should be, right? So magnesium mm. is definitely found in, in whole grains, in legumes, the nuts and seeds. And these are foods that we, you know, are very often associated with, with good health outcomes across the board. But it's very easy for someone to go without having, you know, nuts and seeds regularly, without having legumes regularly. And as a result, it's not, not, not very easy to then have not enough magnesium in your diet. And that could also play a contributing role to, uh, you know, sexual dysfunction and changes in hormone levels and so on and so forth. Yeah, the, the research that I found on zinc um, was very much related to, to males who were very active. And so okay. the, the benefit of the supplementation came from the fact that there was large amounts of zinc and magnesium being lost in the sweat. Okay. So, so I would agree. I, I would say I, when I did a Google search, you'll see a lot about zinc and how, and so if I were a male, I could see myself just going to the store and being like, well, I got to get a zinc supplement. But, but in the research, it was really mostly done in males who were, who are heavy sweaters. And, and so if that's the case, if you are a heavy sweater, which goes for anyone, whether you have a hormone imbalance or not, you should be replenishing those levels, um, you know, through adequate diet or potentially supplementation, but it's very individualized. Right. But the magnesium point is, is very interesting. And, and I think that this, you know, we, there's a lot of talk of magnesium, especially since I specialize in gut health and, um, you know, its role in just smooth muscle contraction and helping with constipation and, and, and then mental health, anxiety and depression. So, and, and then also you talk about some of those food sources and I think of, you know, whole grains and legumes and you see people going on these, you know, lower carb diets or restrictive diets yep. and, um, you know, cutting out a lot of those foods when our, you know, there's, there's this idea that now our soil is, is not the way that it was, you know, several years ago. And so that's another reason why potentially our magnesium levels in the food could be, could be lower, but bottom line is a lot of people are deficient in magnesium and it's, it's role in just every process in the body is so important. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and even nuts and seeds being a key source. So this, this actually reminds me of another study that I encountered that showed that, you know, lower fat diets, you no, know, not that, I mean, I, I feel like this lower fat concept is less pervasive now than it might've been years ago, but lower fat diets were also so associated with the reduced testosterone levels, understandably. So given that, you know, uh, fat, fatty acids are, are important for the synthesis of, of hormones and, and things like that. Um, so yeah. That's another little uh, piece of uh, piece of advice. You know, you want to have those those quote unquote healthy fats. Although I feel like that the healthy fat concept is so so popularized, I I, I would hope that many people are not avoiding fats. But you know, you don't know. Yeah, and the right kind of fats too. You know, I think the the biggest thing to remember for anybody who's listening is that you know we we need fat to make hormones you have to think of it as like you're you're making a recipe well you can't you know make the cake without the eggs and the flour and all that it's the same kind of concept when it comes to you know that that same idea is we need the fats to make it so and it's the right type so maybe we can segue into types of fats um i think that might be a good 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 place to do it but before we do that um, you know, I feel like this is what a client would ask me. So you know, what types of nuts, like what types of nuts are high in magnesium and are there some that aren't, or maybe we can be a little bit more specific there. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I, I think when you're picking any nut from the tree nut family, which <laughs> actually excludes like peanuts, technically speaking, right? So peanuts aren't, in, aren't considered tree nuts, you know, so you have almonds and cashews and pistachios and walnuts and pecans. I mean, you know, variety is always is always king, you know what I mean? But what ends up happening is in a perfect world, I would love people to cycle through and enjoy different types of, of nuts and seeds in their routine. I find what's more likely is people have a favorite one and they stick to that. And so, you know, fair enough. But I think, you know, I, I, I don't think you can go wrong with uh, one type of nut or seed over the other. I know almonds, I believe, might be the highest magnesium per serving, if I remember correctly. But that's so easy to, to look up that, you know, it, it's all good. Yeah. I, I, I love that idea of, of variety. And, and when we get variety, you know, you, you do yourself a service because you're, you're getting a variety of other nutrients along with that. So almonds, cashews, and Brazil nuts, I believe are, are the highest in True. magnesium, but to your point, all of them, all of them are great sources of those, those fats. So, so now healthy fats, as we're continuing to sure. talk about them, let's start with omega threes. I, I rave about omega threes on a daily basis because I don't think enough of, um, you know, Americans are consuming them. And then just the fact that the standard American diet is much higher in those omega six and more inflammatory fats because they're not being balanced out by those, um, healthy omega three sources. And 
so maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, when I, so when I talk about omega-3s, how I describe them is I describe them as elusive. And mm. what I mean by that is they're just not found in that many foods, right? So it's very easy. And if I'm talking with some of my clients, I, I will tell my clients it's very easy to have what looks like a strong dietary pattern and not, not be getting any omega-3s because you're looking at certain types of fish. You're looking at what flaxseed, walnut, chia seed, hemp seed, you know, maybe a little bit in soy. Beyond that, you know, assuming it's not added, right? So, and again, the American market has way more products. So I don't know what you guys are adding omega-3s to. to you know, Every, like everything stuff. now. Yeah, <laughs> right. And I, I make a point of that because I know, I know that to be the case. So I, I, I can't speak to everything that you guys have added omega-3s to. Uh, omega-3 eggs as well. Obviously, we have those in Canada. But beyond that, right, and also keeping in mind that, you know, even among those foods, it really is certain types of fish, trout, salmon, you know, even shrimp doesn't have that much, you know, yeah. people think sea seafood, but really shrimp has a very small amount compared to stuff like trout, salmon, sardines, uh, mackerel. And again, you know, do I have every omega-3 content, every fish memorized? I don't, but it's easy enough to pull up on the internet. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of have at this point because I'm yeah. just like, it's something that I particularly, my clients are very specific. They want to know exactly right. how to get the biggest bang for their buck and um, you know, sardines are among the top, um, yep. mackerel. And then, you know, there's tuna, which you have to be, you know, moderate consumption of that just because of the mercury. And, um, and then what is it? The, um, oysters are an excellent source. And then as you get lower, like you said, you know, the halibut and, and scallops and, and some of the, the shrimp and things like that. But, um, important to note too, is you have the EPA and the DHA, which are, are much more prevalent yes. and found in the, the marine sources. So when I say to my clients, you know, those are the sources, well, here's your list to pick from. You've got sardines, you've got mackerel, right. and people are like, um, Aaron, I don't like any of those things. So sometimes we're, we're supplementing with a really high quality supplement and, and having to do that, especially if it's a food preference. But um, the, the sources that you mentioned, flaxseed, chia seed, um, walnuts, those are great. And so I always have clients throw them in a smoothie or add them to their oatmeal. Um, is there anything in particular that you see your clients do or recommend that they, in ter terms of how to add them in? I find more often than not, smoothies come up and then, and then, and then yogurt parfaits come up a lot. Yeah. You know, pe people tend to enjoy, you know, people tend to enjoy using yogurt as like a facilitator to get more fruits and more nuts in season when they might not otherwise eat fruits or nuts and seeds, for example. So I have to say yogurt definitely comes up a lot. Excellent. In, yeah. in terms of a vehicle for flaxseed or, or chia seed. But chia seed pudding is a big one I push on people to try, to try at the very least. Um, yeah. That's a hit or miss, you know, but uh, it's something. So, and the reason it's a hit or a miss, I'm assuming, is because of the texture, right? Yeah, texture is massively important to some people. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's no question. So if somebody's listening and they've never tried chia seeds, what happens is, is when you add them to a liquid, they gel up almost like a little fish egg. And my biggest complaint, I don't mind the taste or the texture at all, but they can get stuck in your teeth. So, you know, yes. you go to smile at someone and you got a teeth full of seeds, but if you don't like the way that they gel up and, and like have that texture, you can also try blending them. Um, I actually have a recipe for this in my cookbook is you can blend them with maybe some like milk or, and some dates to sweeten it a little bit. And then you won't have so much of like a kind of a, I'm not going to call it gritty, but the texture is smoother when you, when you blend it in a, in a blender. And if you, if you want to do that, you can do it, or you can go for flaxseed, which is, um, you know, a little bit of a nuttier taste and, and doesn't gel up the way that um, a chia seed would. And maybe you might not like it as much. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know ground. I mean, ground flaxseed is awesome. It adds a nice little crunch to things. Yeah, I think uh, it's delicious. Awesome. So that's the healthy fats. Those are the omega threes. We want to incorporate more of those. Um, and then, you know, cruciferous vegetables is a big one that I I try to push. Um, you know, especially if um, somebody's diet is very low in vegetables in general, but you know, broccoli tends to be more accepted. Um, but things like Brussels sprouts and radishes and kale obviously, obviously. Um, your favorite <laughs> goes with that question goes with that question when these foods when we eat these foods they release a phytochemical and this helps our body with our estrogen metabolism and clearance so especially my females who are um, symptomatic of estrogen dominance i'm really incorporating a lot more of these foods and helps the body to clear out estrogen and and it works the similar way with males as well 
Right. And I actually, I've seen in, in, in the study that I'm, I, I kind of referenced loosely a couple of times already that uh, dark leafy green vegetable intake was associated, um, you know, so the increased intake of, of those foods was associated with higher testosterone levels. So, yeah, I mean, this, I mean, the, you know, we, you know, we know that these like, vegetables are so important, but having these little sub sub justifications, I think it help people to get the motivation right to understand that, you know, there's a very near-term goal, a near-term purpose that they serve beyond just protecting you from some imaginary evil 20 years down the line, you know? Yeah. Now, this is one I've been working with a lot of clients recently uh, on how to get more, especially as we're, tr we're transitioning, you know, here in Boston into the cooler weather. And mm -hmm. my clients are saying to me, you know, I don't want to eat a kale salad for lunch. And so maybe we can talk about some ways to get more of these vegetables. And uh, my two favorites are to do pureed soups, like doing you know, some potatoes and kale and carrots and onions, maybe some bone broth for a little extra protein and just kind of blend that all up and, and maybe have a soup or um, I can't actually remember what my second one was because a lot of my clients aren't in the mood for smoothies right now. And that's not usually great if they're having digestive issues. And first thing in the morning, sometimes you don't really want something that's super cold. But do you have any recommendations right. for ways to incorporate more of those? Right. Well, I'll start by saying if one of my clients ever told me that that, that they wouldn't they want kale salad for lunch, we wouldn't be working together after that. <laughs> However, uh, assuming they said something else and we were still working together, I mean, I, I find I don't know. My clients tend to like I, it's hard to generalize, but I find like frozen vegetables are just very popular. People just love throwing them in the oven, sautéing them. You know, roasted vegetables with like you know with a, with a, a nice spice like a smoked paprika that makes everything taste good. Mm. I find like that's how that, that I don't know if it's it's probably my person on some level it's your own personal bias that you impart upon people you work with on some level. But sure. it seems to be that that's quite popular among the people I work with. So yeah, yeah. and you can get you can get real fancy. You know, you can you can saute some greens and you can throw a crunch on there with some pumpkin yeah. seeds, some almonds. You could do like a balsamic drizzle. You could add um, you know a little Parmesan cheese on top. Um, get creative with it and try to have fun with it so that it's something that that you enjoy. Is that would be my advice. Yeah, and I mean, you want to you know five, five ingredient kale salad. You know, that's those magic words on Google. You'd be surprised what you can come up with. Yeah, Google is you know? great. Google and no. Pinterest. I love Pinterest. They've got some right, great, yeah. great recipes on there. I mean, I, you know, was watching a, a movie the other day and it was getting so boring. And I just went on Pinterest and was pinning three million recipes. It's my favorite thing. Kale chips as well. You know, kale chips are are, are well liked. You can make them at home. You don't have to buy the expensive store varieties. You can you know make them pretty easily. Again, yeah. you Google it. You know, easy don't kale chip spend, recipe. Call don't it have to day. spend seven dollars on a bag when you can make your own for much cheaper. Sure, that's well, like twenty dollars Canadian. So you definitely don't want to be spending that much. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it's wild. Um, and then selenium is another, um, you know, it's essential, an essential trace mineral that I think not many people really are getting in their diet. And it is also essential for male fertility. I love Brazil nuts, just yes. one or two Brazil nuts. You get like over a hundred percent of your daily value. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's true. I do. I do recall Brazil nuts being incredibly high in that one particular uh, nutrient. Yeah. My mom and I, because I, during COVID, I've been staying a lot at her place just because it's, you know, there's more space there. We'll go into the fridge every morning and we'll take, we'll, you know, she'll say, did you have your Brazil nut today? It's almost like taking a multivitamin, you know, you get your- Right. Your it's a truly vitamin. functional food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really awesome and great for, especially for thyroid function and everything else. Um, so eat your Brazil nuts, just one a day, one a day. I, I honestly, on that note, I often tell my clients sometimes who, who are not partial to legumes to almost think of them like, listen, you have to have three bowls of these a day. No, but think of them, you know, put a few in where you can, and they're very effective at what they do. And you can think of them almost like a medicine of sorts. You know, if they're there, they're going to play a meaningful role and they don't have to play a massive role, but I'd sooner you have a couple of lentils sprinkled here and there than not have them at all. It's because they are, you know, they're so incredibly high in fiber, so incredibly high in, in, in like a variety of like antioxidant phytochemical compounds that, so it would be a shame not to get them in. I love that concept because, you know, I, I definitely encourage my clients to never go from a restrictive mindset. We always focus on what you can add in, but I also think you just touched on a really good point there of, especially people who have that all or nothing type mentality and you know they assume that if you have to eat lentils that your meal is now lentil based where it doesn't have to be it could be 
you know, you're making turkey meatballs or something and you mash some lentils into it, or you're making, you know, a burger and you, you know, mash some, you know, mushrooms, it, like little things like that here and there versus, um, you know, a little bit goes a long way. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, so vitamin D, let's talk vitamin D because this is, this is the blog post you just um, most recently writ wrote about. Yeah. And I mean, I, I could talk about vitamin D all day with regards to the importance for gut health and thyroid function, um, which, you know, those definitely play into sexual health for males and females. But why don't you maybe just take it away from what your, your um, current research endeavors brought you down and, and what you would suggest? Yeah, I mean, vitamin D is in the same group of omega-3s and that it is quite elusive, you know what I mean? Again, I, you know, I don't know how many products it's being, it's being placed into in the States, probably more than here, but it's not that easy to get a vitamin D from your diet. You know, most Canadians, most Canadians don't get enough. Uh, the circulating levels in Canadians, especially in the winter, is really poor and it's worse in men uh, than women. And so what did I find about vitamin D and sexual health? Well, you can't make this stuff up, but yeah, I found that low vitamin D, so a couple of correlational studies, right? A couple low vitamin D status was associated with increased risk of premature ejaculation, believe it or not. Um, that was the main notable finding that I came across when I wrote my most recent article. And, you know, so, I mean, there's, I, I, as far as I could tell, there were no studies that showed when you supplement vitamin D, uh, you know, premature ejaculation goes away. Obviously that's like a multifactorial issue and vitamin D, um, deficiency or inadequacy in the diet is, is relatively uh, prevalent, but uh, I found it to be a very interesting finding. And if, you know, if, if guys out there need a motivation to, you know, have some fish, which happens to be an incredibly rich source of vitamin D and omega-3s, which you discussed, then uh, that's a pretty good one. Mm. And, and I want to also point out too, you know, it is a very common deficiency and there aren't many food, the food sources are, you know, high fat fish, um, white mushrooms and, um, beef liver, I think has some vitamin D in there and then eggs. So right. again, very few sources. And so if a client comes to me and they're, they're saying, you know, my vitamin D levels are, you know, 20. And so that's obviously low now what can I eat to get them back into the normal range? Well, first of all, I personally, just based on the research that I've done, you know, you can't really get your vitamin D levels back to the normal range by just eating, you know, high vitamin D foods. You have to eat a lot of high vitamin D rich foods in order to do that. That's where a supplement comes into play and can be really beneficial, um, right. you know, in conjunction with those foods. Of course, those foods offer incredible benefits and still should be consumed. But in terms of, you know, men's sexual health, I think get your vitamin D levels checked, right? Wouldn't that be the, the best recommendation so you could at least know? Yeah, and that, that is, vitamin D is definitely one that's more frequently checked in, in, the, in like the blood work. So if you went to your family doctor here in Canada, you're going to, are, are they going to check your testosterone every single time? Definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. And they may, and, and it may not even be covered unless you're over a certain age, or if you really, really present strongly, or if you go to a special doctor where you're paying you know, maybe out of pocket or something, right? But vitamin D is way more frequently checked as it should be, right? It's a, it's a very significant issue in, in you know, in, in like the Northern latitude places in the world, just because of uh, the lack of the sun strength, lack of the sun exposure. And again, like you said, it's, it's extremely elusive. Like fish, fish contains a significant amount, but even the other foods that contain it, there's, there's just not that much going around. Obviously it's, it's, it's fortified, you know, in, in soy milk and almond milk, if you get the right variety, you know, not some independent brand, but some bigger brand very likely to be fortified. I don't know. How, I think that's the same. I assume it's the same in the States. It's definitely the case here in Canada, but even so it's, it's not that much. Yeah. And oftentimes the fortification, you know, you'll see vitamin D2, which is not the best way to be absorbing right. vitamin D and converting it into the active form D3. And so you know, get your, get, get your levels checked, definitely be mindful of it and make sure that you're, you know, you're getting plenty of dietary sources. But I mean, we could, we could do a whole episode just on vitamin D and its role in the body, but right. so, so important, important. All right. So then we talked omega-3. Let's talk about soy. Soy is yep. very controversial. And I know you've done a bunch of different posts on this. And we did touch a little bit about this um, in my last podcast. But what are your thoughts on soy? Um, you know, man boobs, we've heard that they soy can cause man boobs, and it can lower your testosterone. So what, what did you find there in the research? And what would you say? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I haven't found any evidence to to suggest that that's the case. I mean, that's the simplest way to say it, that it has any adverse effects and certainly not the level at which it's consumed, you know what I mean, which is 
I don't I don't know that it's that widely consumed in like a, especially in an omnivorous an omnivore an omnivorous guy who's not like a vegetarian so yeah I have not seen any evidence that it I mean like in any meaningful fashion in any population or any group of people looked at as soy intake is associated with a decrease in in hormone levels or uh, decrease in like sexual functioning or anything like that. I mean, my view is this, is that, you know, a diversifying protein intake is second only to vegetables in, in, in like maintaining really good health, right? You know, so diversifying protein intake, I mean, not only relying on traditional sources like chicken and beef, which is what most people end up having, but, but exploring, you know, plant proteins, having, you know, uh, marine proteins, things like that. I think that's a very, very important step, especially when you consider that, you know, a lot of the risk factors for like erectile dysfunction, like, let's say are elevated cholesterol levels, are elevated triglyceride levels, you know what I mean? Mm. Is elevated blood pressure. I mean, blood pressure is probably is perhaps less so related, but you know, elevated triglycerides, elevated cholesterol, even even elevated blood sugar levels, you know, those can be partially remedied by diversifying your protein intake because plant proteins like legumes, for example, they're very, very effective at, at managing blood sugar and blood cholesterol, right? And so mm. and, and so yeah, I mean that's that's the key theme, I think, for me is, is, is really diversifying the protein intake. Right. I like that. And I, and I, what you're saying too, is there, you know, we, we can, we can isolate these topics all day, but, but how did, what's the downstream effect of all of these things and how are they all related? Because they are, I think that's important is, you know, nothing's ever just zinc is good or, or magnesium is good. It's always because what's mm-hmm. happening from the downstream effect of it and, and what's the source and stuff like that. Now game changers was a huge, you know, a huge thing this year blew right. up and, you know, you saw the study where they took the the males and they, you know, fed them a plant-based diet or not even a diet. It was just one meal. They fed them a plant-based meal versus a non-plant-based meal. And then they measured their erections overnight. And, you know, what a, what a smart marketing theme to right. try to capture a male's attention and, and try to sway them to the side of plant-based. Totally think that that is just, it's, it's just not right. That's not morally right to do. That's not a research right. study. That's just, you know, a right. one-time exposure. What were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I wrote on the game. I wrote on the game changers. I blogged about it. I mean, the reality is, I mean, for sure. I mean, there, there are definitely some underhanded tactics uh, in that film and similar to in what the health. Um, I think the message is an important message that they're trying to share and they took a lot of liberties to, to share it. Now, if you asked me three years ago, I would say that I don't mind those kind of tactics for an important message. But if you ask me today, I think honesty is, is very important. I mean, obviously I thought that back then, but I believe like honesty and like discourse is really important, but I mean, it's, it's, it's an entertainment. So like they took their liberties. It is what it is. I mean, it's not, you know, certain parts of the film were not great. Uh, certainly what you mentioned doesn't, doesn't um, come to me as a highlight of the film. It was a little yeah. bit, a little bit silly. Um, but, but on the other side of it, uh, you know, Mediterranean diet associated with reduced risk of erectile dysfunction, for example. You know, again, a Mediterranean diet is essentially uh, the midway point between being a vegan and being an omnivore. So I think that style of eating is something that can, I think, resonate with people, kind of trending more in that direction, which is what I was alluding to earlier. Yeah, and that middle ground or that word balance is is never sexy to anybody. So, you know, I think that right. that's where it becomes difficult. But back to soy so for oh yes yes oh yes so people who are listening um you know soy contains a high amount of um you know basically a a plant type of estrogen that is it's what we call a phytoestrogen that is similar in function to human estrogen but it has much weaker effects in the body so these um these compounds can basically bind to estrogen receptors in the body and they can either cause a weak estrogenic or anti-estrogenic effect so the the problem is is we don't know which person might act in a way where it could increase their estrogen or potentially decrease their estrogen but we know that they are similar in function to human estrogen and have potential to have effects weaker than estrogen in the body so i always like to point that out of just understanding the mechanism behind how it works um but then it really comes down to that that individuality because I have females who are, you know, have hormonal imbalance and aren't having regular cycles. And when we implement it, it could have a negative impact. Now, whereas I might have a client who's in her 50s, 60s, maybe she's going through menopause or, you know, out of menopause. And so soy might be a really beneficial thing for her, but it is very individualized. And, And the research, as you mentioned, does not conclude, I mean, research never really concludes anything, right? It never says, it never is a hard fact, this is good, this is bad, but research doesn't support the idea that soy is 
bad for us or that it is hormone altering in a way that would be dramatic to Im impact someone's health in a negative way. And so we can definitely say that we've seen that in the research, but understanding what's happening in the body and kind of how the compounds work is important. And I think just knowing that it is going to be very individualized. Yeah. And from what I've seen, I think the number I've seen floating around and you can let me know if you see it differently. I've seen that it has that the phytoestrogen have one two hundredth of the affinity for the estrogen receptor. Mm. Um, uh, so, which is obviously quite very weak. Right. Um, so that, that's one thing. Another thing I've actually written on soy intake and PCOS, because if you follow internet logic, you would think that, okay, PCOS hormone issues, soy potentially causes hormone issues. Those two things, those two things don't go together. But from what I've seen, I mean, yes, limited, lim limited evidence as it may be, it does seem that soy intake and with PCOS actually can help, um, you know, create favorable changes and we'll call in the androgen profile. We'll just, we'll just say that, that for as a general statement, because obviously that's not my exact area of expertise, but this is what I've seen. And I've written on this as well. Yeah. You know, I have seen a little bit of research on PCOS and that, and again, not my expertise PCOS, but um, very interesting. And it's also important to also think of, okay, well, what's, what type of soy is being studied and um, right. you know, that there's so much to it that we're not going to dive into right now, but I think that, you know, keeping in mind it's individual, but is, is soy going to cause, you know, decrease in testosterone? What would your final answer to that be, I guess? Yeah, I, I would say, yeah. I mean, I have no, I have no evidence to suggest it will, you know what I mean? Even as much as you, as someone on the internet or, 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 or someone influencer you like will present it in a way that logically sounds like it will, and you might like, you might want to believe it. Um, you know, then if you go down that rabbit hole, then it's going to be very problematic for all sorts of different foods. Yeah. Um, no, so I think soy inclusion of soy as part of like a diverse protein intake is going to have a net positive benefit on your uh, overall sexual health. That would be my, my statement on that. Yeah. So back to that, that same point of diversification. Yeah. Now foods that increase blood flow. So we can talk about kind of the, the role of nitric oxide in the body. And right. I work with a lot of athletes. So this is something that I typically will, will include encourage these foods, which people get excited about because they include, you know, dark chocolate and stuff. But, you know, there's a lot of supplements out there right now, especially in the athletic um, field, because of the fact that these foods can actually improve uh, blood flow in the body. Right. And I know you've yeah. done a post on this, right? Yeah, yeah. I was looking at one of the old posts I wrote on the Mediterranean diet and sexual health. And one of the things that I guess I came across was that, you know, nuts and seeds, obviously a very big part of the Mediterranean diet. Uh, contain a precursor, uh, you know, uh, arginine, which can then uh, act as a vasodilator, increase blood flow. I mean, I, I, however modestly it does that as a, as a function of everything else that these foods do in the body, but uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So these foods that basically can increase the production of nitric oxide yeah. um, include things like beets, garlic, uh, dark chocolate, leafy greens, citric, citrus fruits, pomegranates, and then as Andy mentioned, nuts and seeds. So, you know, you guys are just hopefully pen and paper is out right now, writing a grocery list of all of right. these foods, because we're also seeing some really great crossover here. You're seeing leafy greens again, you're seeing nuts and seeds, which we talked about when we talked about magnesium. So these are just, you know, all things to, to be adding into your rotation. Yeah, there, there are a few key food groups that, you know, sh should be included for the betterment of your health. And if you're missing out on them, then you, you know, if you really want to achieve everything that you you can you know food doesn't fix everything right so we can't pretend that if someone has erectile dysfunction or really low sex drive that's going to be guaranteed that you know increasing these food groups is going to fix it but unless you do that you can't be sure it won't you know yeah. so that, that's kind of my, my my take on that yeah it definitely can't hurt to be adding these um you know nutrients dense foods into your diet now any other things that you would add specific to foods or nutrition? I think we'll kind of segue into just a few lifestyle factors that are important that I feel like we'd be doing a disservice if we didn't mention. Yeah, um, no, I, I feel like we've discussed a lot of a lot of really good stuff. You know what I mean? We discussed legumes, we discussed nuts and seeds, we discussed vegetables. I mean, look, we discussed fish. Uh, as you know, if you like fish, is a really big thing. I mean, I, I you know, I think I think fruit obviously has a role to play here as well. Vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think people avoid avoid fruit not always for the best reasons, but you know, those those are the fundamental food groups as far as I'm concerned to optimize you know general and uh, sexual health. So and I think we covered it. Yeah, what a funny concept that we are we are living in a day and age where where fruit has become something that is scary, you know. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a real thing, right? It's a real thing, and it's tough because if you are just a person in the world and you're going online and you're trying to figure out, you know, how you should, you know, how you should arrange yourself around food, it's an impossible task, almost impossible task because there's so much competing information. Um, it's very difficult to know who, who to put your faith into. There's a mm-hmm. lot of um, what are tempting offers out there that sound mm-hmm. reasonable and sound perfectly logical, which of course are not really based on anything. So it's very tough. I, I sympathize with anyone who's trying to find their way. That's why you should work with a dietitian if, you, if you're fortunate enough to be able to do so. Yeah, absolutely. One of the one of the biggest things that I hear from clients who are looking to potentially work with me is they say I they'll they'll ramble on for a little while and then they'll just come to the conclusion of I don't know how to eat anymore. Like I just don't know yeah. what to eat or how to eat and and it's just so confusing. So Yes, to your point, if you can work with a dietitian, that is definitely my recommendation. So sleep, this is my favorite topic, partially I'm obsessed with my own sleep and I am very vigilant about it. It's like my non-negotiable and I did my thesis on it as part of my master's degree. So sleep is so important, especially when it comes to, to hormones. And we just have to think about, you know, what's actually happening when we sleep is we are, are in a state of regeneration and rest and recovery. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, my, my sleep, my sleep for my, for the majority of my life has been just okay. You know, sleep mm-hmm. has never been my, my strong suit. And I actually, I actually don't know that much about the, uh, about the, the sleep literature and the research. So I'm happy for you to fill me in on it. Yeah. So, uh, Obstructive sleep apnea is is the first topic, and that's when we see you know the the throat muscles relaxing when somebody's sleeping, and that's blocking the airway. Number one sign of this is having snoring, and so we see lower oxygen to our blood. And there's about thirty percent of middle aged men who experience this, and and oftentimes we'll see that they are struggling with their weight, and they'll be overweight, but this certainly isn't always the case. And there's normal weight individuals who they might frequently miss the diagnosis for this because oftentimes doctors are looking for that, you know, them being overweight as a way to diagnose. But um, about 50 to 80% of men with obstructive sleep apnea have erectile dysfunction. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. It's fascinating. Yeah. So this basically this having this condition can lower testosterone levels and, and actually supplementing with testosterone can actually worsen it. Um, so, right. so that's a really key point to keep in mind for people who do have that condition. Um, but a CPAP has been shown to improve it. And then we go into insomnia, which is just general having, you know, a tough time falling asleep. Um, I think especially right now, it's a major epidemic about, you know, one third of the adult population um, are probably struggling with sleep right now, especially because of the stress levels in the world. And, um, you know, I I know for myself when, when things happen, I'm absolutely not sleeping as well as I normally am. Yeah, I mean, look, I uh, I'm in that boat as well, and uh, yeah, that's that, that's a fascinating thing. I looked a little bit. I mean, I wrote an article that has you know very preliminary evidence, but you know, C- CBD as a as a tool for you know for sleep management. I, you know, I mean, look, the evidence is, is is minimal, and it's it's legal now in Canada. I know the states; it's very complicated, um, but there 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 seems to be something there. And if if ever better studies are conducted, we might learn more about a potential interaction. But it's a fascinating, potentially low risk avenue. Because I, I suppose it's hard if you don't sleep well, you know, and you and, and obviously there's medication, but there's there, I, I, I'm not intimately familiar, but I know there's dependence associated stuff like that. So it's not the most appealing road to take, I don't think. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if you knew this, but I'm a holistic cannabis practitioner and I have my own um, yeah, yeah. line of CBD oil products that I are all lab. That. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks for the plug though. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So I do have my own line of um, lab certified CBD products and um, it is definitely something that, and I, and I, I decided to become a holistic cannabis practitioner through, it's actually a, um, the holistic cannabis Academy, which is recognized by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is why I chose it. And it, awesome. it's fascinating. I mean, when you learn the, the inner works of the endocannabinoid system and, and how these phytocannabinoids from CBD are benefiting the body, it just, it makes so much sense. And it also allows you to be really skeptical about what you're seeing on the market and, and understand mm-hmm. how to dose it and things like that. So I offer free 15 minute consultations to anybody who's just curious about it or has questions about dosing. 
um, which you can, you know, direct people to on my website if you ever come across anybody who's just confused okay. about it. And, and this is not like not to even purchase the product. It's a free 15 minute consult just to learn about it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah really, really cool. Yeah, no, I, I'm, fa I'm fascinated. Like I said, I mean, I did write an article. I researched a lot into CBD and anxiety and sleep management as like a low risk method uh, management tool. It's very fascinating stuff. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so insomnia, you know, that's a big one that can really, you know, play a role in erectile dysfunction. And just because of the sole fact that it's, it's disrupting our circadian rhythm. And this is especially common in shift workers. So right. that's number two. And then restless leg syndrome, which, um, you know, if you have it, you probably know, but there's been some, you know, potential correlations with iron deficiency anemia and, you know, things like that, but um, that can also impact erectile dysfunction and then noctiuria, so urinating throughout the night. Um, and this is, you know, especially common with males who are older and, you know, even potentially have some sort of prostate issues, but having that fragmented sleep can lower our testosterone levels, um, especially because of just the, the natural rhythm or, you know, different concentrations of I don't know if concentrations is the right word, levels of testosterone, t testosterone in the blood during certain stages of sleep. So right. that's another, so sleep is so important, you know, and, and I'll, I'm going to actually be doing an episode on this in a few weeks, but um, you know, my best advice is to have a bedtime routine, limit exposure to blue light as much as you can. Um, and, and yeah, the certain nutrients that we've already talked about play a role in, in improving sleep. And then of course, you know, certain low risk medications like melatonin and CBD can be really helpful. Right. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's super fascinating. Yeah. I enjoyed that. That was good. Good. It's I'm something, glad. something for me to look into more myself actually. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so that's sleep. And then, you know, we kind of touched a little bit on medications, um, you know, just about specifically blood pressure and heart medications, and then there's also medications that treat uh, psychiatric and neurological disorders. And those right. are definitely um, something to look into with your doctor. So if you are on any sort of medications like this, there, there are options out there that some have even specifically blood pressure and heart medications that have actually been shown to improve erectile dysfunction. So the best thing you can do is if you're on any sort of medication, discuss it with your doctor. And if you are having symptoms of, um, you know, low testosterone or low libido, just talk to them and, and let them know what's going on. And, and then they can give you options, hopefully that can, can kind of alleviate some of your symptoms. Yeah. Now that you bring that up, I do recall like, encountering this myself as well, that there are certain medications for blood pressure lowering specifically that are uh, perhaps more or less inclined to interfere with uh, rectal functioning. I do remember coming across that. So yeah, that's an important point. And blood pressure medication is common, right? It's, um, again, it's among the most commonly prescribed medications. Um, so yeah, it's a very good point. Yeah. And then um, I, I wanted to talk about this one and then we can kind of wrap up, but uh, xenoestrogens, which basically are endocrine disruptors that can act like estrogen in the body. We find these things in plastics, skincare products, shampoo, deodorant, um, and these can have hormone disrupting properties for both males and females. So, I mean, this can be a tough one for some people, but like, you know, if you're, if you're meal prepping right. all your food in a bunch of plastic containers, if you're using a lot of synthetic, um, fragrance, uh, you know, body washes. I, I went through a run in the commons today and I, I passed by three different men and I almost passed out from the amount of cologne that I could. Oh, see. right, right, right. And, um, and so I'm not saying, you know, if I were to work with a client, I'm not going to tell them that they need to no be cologne. like, no cologne, no, no deodorant. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to, I'm going to be single forever, but no. you know, there's a lot of really great options out there. Um, you know, even my boyfriend has switched to some all natural shampoo and conditioner and he's, there you loving, go. Yep, he's, he's on board. And, um, so there's, there's things out there. If you go to the ewg.org, um, they have lotions and they have, um, shampoos and conditioners that don't contain these products. And it, it's, you know, you might think like, what is it, what impact does it really have? But there's some research that's pretty strong that shows that these can really significantly impact, um, you know, our endocrine system. And so looking into just how can you make little changes here and there and eventually uh, get to a place where you're not, your load of these different types of endocrine disruptors has gone down because there's so many different, different places that you can find them. 
Right. Oh, that's fascinating. That's something that I have not personally looked into, but that that's another fascinating potential future, uh, future blog topic to explore. And it's one of those things that is not that, I don't think it's that challenge, that challenging to change if someone was so inclined to do so. And you know, that's, it's always fun when you can target something that doesn't turn your life upside down, but has a net positive effect. I'm obviously a big fan of anything that falls in that category. Um, so yeah, very interesting. Yeah. So, you know, switch to glass containers. Don't drink, don't reuse your plastic water bottles. Um, like I said, use that site to look at natural skincare products and, um, yeah, it can make a huge difference. So, all right. So what would you say are the biggest three takeaways for the listener today? Um, if they are interested in, you know, improving their male sexual health, what would be your, your top three? Um, uh, okay. Well, number one, I would Google the Mediterranean food guide and have a, have a look at how it's structured in terms of patterning of eating. I think that most people are, are not eating in that way, but would benefit from eating in that way. And they don't have to give up anything necessarily to do that. They just have to change the frequency with which they consume certain food groups and incorporate some food groups, which are, they're not incorporating. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely say that. Love it. I would say, I would say number two, um, you know, I guess, cause we talked about, we talked about soy so much. I would say don't don't avoid, uh, don't avoid soy, especially soy, you know, being a food that allows you to pursue a more Mediterranean style of eating. You know, it gives you that alternative to the usual, uh, you know, beef and poultry and gives you an alternative protein source. So don't cut things out unless you have a really, really good reason to do so. I think that's number two, because variety is important and exposing yourself to different types of, of beneficial compounds is important. And then number three, I suppose, I guess one, I guess this is something that you actually brought to my mind is don't underestimate the role of things that are, you know, not necessarily directly related to, to food. So, okay. You brought up the, uh, you know, the potential, you know, uh, xenoestrogens, okay. Sleep, uh, physical activity, stress management, you know, perhaps even like, you know, changing your, your routine, incorporating meditation or yoga. So don't, you know, don't lose sight of the little things. Uh, I think that's something that, you know, I, I may not have said at the beginning of the podcast, but now that we've dealt into this a bit, I think, you know, a lot of little things, a lot of little changes obviously mean, mean something big ultimately. So I'll go with those three. Yeah, I love those. And, and I think you just touched upon stress, which we didn't really cover, but, um, you know, stress is huge. It's, it's so intertwined into everything that we talked about. Yeah. And on a physiological level, I mean, you know, I always say this to my clients, especially those who are, you know, having certain foods around fear around foods or whatever stress will do worse to your body than any one food can do. So stress is something that sure. we're all probably struggling with in some way, some more than others, especially during this time. Um, so as Andy mentioned, meditation, um, you know, you know, mindfulness, less time on social media, like there's so many things you can do, little things here and there, but, um, you know, put your it's, mental health. Yeah. But separating food from work and i find that's something very common people are trying to eat while they're doing work especially now working from home yeah that's what comes up so much i'm really 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 encouraging people to say listen like take the 15 minutes enjoy your food you know like put the computer away you're not you don't need to write the report while you have your you know your lentil soup you know what i mean so i think that's really really important and that actually falls in that third grouping of things that people underestimate just mm. how you know how powerful it can be to actually just separate eating from everything else Mm -hmm. um, and, and actually taking a moment to enjoy your food and, and, and chewing it properly and, and all that good stuff. So I think that's very easy to underestimate. I mean, as someone who specializes in digest, digestive health, I've had clients do nothing to their diet, but, but put their phone away and chew their food, put their fork down between bites and they've had their first bowel movement. That's been normal yeah. in like a year. So doesn't surprise me. Yeah. doesn't surprise right. me either, but it's like, you know, they, they are shocked when that happens. Cause it's like, guess what? You didn't have to do anything dramatic of, you know, meal prepping this, that you just chew your food, be present, enjoy it. Yeah. Um, we digress. Now, what is your favorite childhood memory with food, Andy? My favorite childhood memory with food. Um, Honestly, the two, the, two, the two things that come to mind are eating a whole pizza. This, this is why you're getting, you're getting quite, this is not a good memory, right? It's like a favorite. It's funny how I said I ate a lot of pizza. I ate a whole pizza when I was watching a soccer game during March break mm -hmm. and I got really sick and then I had like four slices of dairy cream cake and I got sick. Like I enjoyed when I was eating it, you know? So I don't know that comes to mind. If I'm being honest, if that's the first, those are the first two things that come to mind. I like that. I like when people just, they, they roll with that versus trying to come up with something. Now, are you're not lactose intolerant, are you? Um, you know what? I mean, for me personally, dairy doesn't play, I mean, ice cream cake is an exception. Don't get me yeah. wrong. Dairy, dairy doesn't play a big role in my life. It's just not my favorite thing. 
yeah uh, for for that's that's the main reason um so whether i'm lactose intolerant or not you know after you get a whole pizza as a teenager you're gonna have a level of aversion to cheese let's put it yeah. that way <laughs> yeah oh, so you have a whole pizza then you get sick you're gonna have, you're gonna have a lifelong sure. aversion to cheese i'm not sure. saying that's scientific or, or i recommend approaching things in that way but we all have our things Hey, it's, it's a form of PTSD right there. And, and I, I ask because I'm lactose intolerant and every time as a kid that I would eat pizza, it was the end result was a stomach ache. But it's like right. you said, pizza, you know, eating whole pizza in general is probably going to get every, anybody a stomach ache. So be very likely. Yeah. <laughs> so where can people find you? Um, you know, your Instagram is awesome. Your blog is awesome, but where can we direct people to connect with you? Yeah. I mean, it's you know, Andy, the RD, that's my website, Andy, the rd.com andy the rd is my instagram you know if you put my name on amazon you can see i've got a couple books on there yeah those would be the three uh the three places or if awesome. you have a nutrition question you type andy in front of it it's possible one of my blogs might come up if i read it on it so you can try that too if you google it maybe awesome. <laughs> yeah, so i love it awesome andy well thank you so much for coming on this was such a great conversation i always appreciate having another rd on here especially one who's very evidence-based and um just really enjoy the conversation so thank you Thanks for having me. It was awesome. All right. See you later. See ya.